quick uh, overview of, of what we're talking about. You can see the name of it is Baptist Covenant Theology, but it's basically uh, we're studying a, f a framework that we believe is a biblical framework for looking at the unfolding revelation of God's redemptive work in Scripture. And uh, so we looked at how that, that uh, structure looks, and most recently, and I'm going to kind of focus specifically on what we talked about last time, uh, last time we looked at the New Covenant. And the New Covenant, and we've, we looked at uh, Hebrews chapter 8, which gives us a, a detailed description of the New Covenant and a contrast of that covenant to the Old Covenant. And uh, we saw several things about the New Covenant and uh, in, contra in contrast to the Old Covenant. So let me give you this little table here. That there were three ba uh, major contrasts that were laid out for us in uh, the the uh, comparison or contrast between the Old and the New Covenants. So one of them was in the place of the law. And in the Old Covenant, the law was written on tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. Uh, it, it, but it was not, for all participants in the Old Covenant, written on the heart. He th that's a little loud for me, If I don't know about everybody else, but I don't like to hear myself that much. So <laughs> Probably nobody else does either if I don't. Um, all right, thank you. Um, so, but in the New Covenant, the law is, is placed in the mind and written on the heart, according to Hebrews 8. Uh, second thing is in terms of relationship to God, not everyone who was a participant or a member of the Old Covenant was, was one who knew God. But in the New Covenant, it says, it says that all know God. In the Old Covenant, not all were forgiven of their sins. But in the new covenant, all in the covenant are forgiven of their sins. So I touched on a couple of implications of that last week. One was in terms of the, the nature of the church, and the other was in, in terms of the character of our worship. Uh, I want to spend, I want to explode that first point here in, in this entire class today and talk about the nature of the church, and one of the implications of that is the subjects of baptism. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, that at, kind of as a consequence of talking about the nature of the church. So let's ask the Lord to bless our study as we go forward. Father in heaven, we look to you and ask for your grace and help as we wrestle with scripture and seek to understand your unfolding plan of redemption. Help us, Father, to understand how, how to read the Old Testament because uh, so much of it is is uh, cast in shadow and is revealed in types and uh, is difficult for us to understand. It was difficult for those living under it to understand and to live under. Uh, but we know, Father, that that is your word, and so we want to understand that. We also want to understand the work of Christ in the uh, in the noonday light of the new covenant. So we ask that you would grant us help in that as well. Help us to understand how these things uh, play out in the life of the church and uh, that we would seek as a church and as individuals to live out the, the, uh, the blessings of the new covenant, uh, both individually and together as your people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So let me begin by, by asking a question. Why is it so important to understand the nature and composition of of the church under the new covenant. Well, um, first of all, there are those who ignore church membership altogether. And they say there's not, we, we're not even going to define the nature and the composition of the church. But people who ignore church membership are putting themselves at risk because they're refusing Christ's provision of the local church and all the, the the provision, the structures, the shepherding, the fellowship, the, the mutual accountability that goes along with that. And they're also muddying the distinction between the church and the world, which is something that the church needs to see and the world needs to see. And just as Paul was saying in his sermon, in order, part, at least in one aspect, to, to really understand the fragrance of the gospel, you have to know who's carrying the fragrance of the gospel. And part of that is to make a, a, a clear distinction between 
the church and the world. So we're going to talk about that briefly. But then there's also another broad category, and that is a, a large portion of, of the uh, Christian church uh, practices admitting infants into the membership of the church. And I believe that those who do that are putting children into a confusing position. And they may also be setting up the church to be ultimately over time filled more and more with unconverted people as some of those children grow into maturity without coming to Christ. Now, before I get into that, I want to say a couple of things because I recognize that there are people here who may hold to some of those convictions. And, uh, and I know that you are, are dear brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, I have a literal sister who holds to these things and, and my brother-in-law. And so um, I'm very sensitive, sensitive to that. Uh, I was in a, a church that was a faithful gospel church for 13 years before we started Grace Heritage Church that believed and taught and practiced these things. And I uh, have great respect and appreciation for that ministry. So everything I say I want to couch in terms of uh, Christian love and, and fellowship and not as a kind of we them type thing. Okay. Um, I want to make it clear that uh, this is not as important as the gospel. And, and I, I know also um, sometimes when you walk in, and maybe this is the first time you've been to Grace Heritage Church, and you think, man, these people are, are kind of uh, majoring on the minor things and, and they have this sort of hobby horse. So let me just tell you, that I, as far as I can remember, this is the first time in eight years that we've even talked about this. Can you think of any? This, as far as any kind of formal teaching on this. So this is not a hobby horse for us. We have great fellowship with those with whom we disagree in this particular area. And particularly, um, I'll say that those that we're closest to are our Presbyterian friends who we agree with on so many things and hold so many things in common and, and have, have greatly appreciated from the, the ministry of those who um, hold to those things. So I hope that will give some context to everything that I say. Um, also, I guess I want to say that, that in order, I mean, I think it's important to address this because this is what we believe and this is what we practice. And, and, I, and, and I believe that conviction in this area is important. Some of you, especially you students, will be leaving here at some point and you'll be faced with finding another church. And one of the issues that you'll, you'll probably discover is some of the best churches in the area are Presbyterian churches that practice this. And so you'll have to wrestle with just what the relative importance of that is compared to the other things that other churches are teaching. And I'm not here to sort all that out for you, but, I, but you just do need to understand, I think, the scriptural basis for what, we're, um, what we proclaim here. Okay. We also agree with our, our Presbyterian friends in particular that this is, a, this is an area of conviction that is worth studying and debating and disagreeing over and, and debating about, and, or I should say just forming convictions about. So we agree with them on, in that particular area as well. Um, my, one of my, my pastor when I was in college said, we have to be careful not to uh, have the tendency to throw stones at our nearest neighbor. And, and that always stuck with me because because in that context, and I think this is true here, our nearest neighbors, not geographically but doctrinally, are our Presbyterian brothers and sisters. And so we, we want to be careful not to throw stones just because they happen to be the closest thing that we can hit a target at. Okay, And that's why I wanted you to know that we haven't talked about this in eight years because this is not so, we, we, we love and appreciate our nearest neighbors, but sometimes they are neighbors and they don't live in the same uh, <laughs> yard as we do so we do need to distinguish that and 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 I think they would agree with us on that <laughs> thank you I wish I'd put that in my notes um, okay so with all that said I think the, the, the point that I was trying to make last time and the, and the point that we can see just from this right here 
and, and the whole structure of what we've been studying so far is that we are in the New Covenant and there is a distinction between the Old and the New Covenant in such that the New Covenant itself should define the nature of the church. We see that the New Covenant creates believers. These, this right column is a description of believers. So the New Covenant creates believers. Believers are people who are justified and regenerated, who's, who are born again, their hearts are changed. But this in, invisible change of position and this invisible change of condition doesn't remain invisible in the lives of God's people. It is visible. I think back to, um, I used to like read the comics and I would say, oh, this is a great one. And I would take it to Debbie and say, here, read this. This is great. And she'd read it and, and then she'd hand it back to me. I'd say, you, you didn't think that was funny? And she said, oh yeah, that was funny. I, I was just laughing on the inside. <laughs> and I just couldn't, I was like, you know, that, I couldn't quite fathom that. But um, <laughs> anyway, but that's, that's not the way faith works. Faith is not something that just happens on the inside. It becomes visible, something that other people can see. And so uh, we see that in many places in Scripture, Matthew 3, 8. Uh, John the Baptist says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Fruit is the outward uh, evidence of the inward attitude of repentance. Mark 4.20 says, But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. John 15.8 says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So fruit bearing, the, the outward actions um, are, and life are uh, the visible manifestation of what is changed on the inside. Well, according to the pervasive teaching, an example of the New Testament is so pervasive, I don't need to proof text this really. Those who are united to Christ and reconciled to God are also united to Christ's people and reconciled to Christ's people. That when, a, when people are changed and, and come to Christ, they don't come to Christ individually, but they, they come to Christ's people. And they're attracted to Christ's people and they gather together. And this new life is lived out in visible connection. Visible connection with other believers in organized local churches. You might want to go home today and read through Ephesians chapter 2. That talks about, it talks about reconciliation and, and it just transitions directly into uh, the kind of reconciliation that happens horizontally between uh, people. So this visible connection is the church, the body of Christ. And, and it's not a, and I've tried to think of another way to say this, but I like this better. It's not an amorphous blob, okay, where you can't, um, where you can't see the shape of it. The church is visible and organized into communities. That's the way the New Testament describes the church as in its visible manifestation. OK, it is it is structured into by Christ into local churches with membership, recognized membership with government, organized worship, personal relationship and mutual help and accountability. So all those things happen as a fruit of being a member of the new covenant. People gather together and they organize their lives together in local churches. It's not just this kind of vague thing out there um, where, you know, people have a secret handshake or something, but they actually live together in local church communities. Our confession, the 1689 confession, says, In exercising the authority entrusted to him, the Lord Jesus, through the ministry of his word by his spirit, calls to himself out of the world those who are given to him by his Father. They are called so that they will live before him in all the ways of obedience that he prescribes for them in his word. Those who are called, he commands to live together in local societies or churches for their mutual edification and the fitting conduct of per public worship that he requires of them while they are in the world. Okay? And so the church, which is put together by the, or, and, and motivated and formed by the 
by the work of Christ in the new covenant, the church is composed of those who make a credible profession of these realities. People who visibly, who bear the fruit of the inner change described by the new covenant. And we can see that um, clearly played out or, or, or is the underlying mindset, you might say, throughout the New Testament. It's not just in Hebrews 8 that we see this because we see um, the writers of Scripture addressing the church as those who possess the realities that they profess in the gospel. So it's, it's assumed that the people in the churches are what they say they are in the gospel. And if you look at, and I'm going to skip over this diagram because we're going to come back to it later. But if you look at um, scripture in, in many different places, you'll see these various descriptions applied to not just the church as an idea, but to that local church. Colossians 3.12 is described as chosen of God. He says, you, the, you people, you real life people that are gathered together there in Colossae, you are chosen of God. That's who they are. That's their, their character, their, their definition. Galatians 3.26 says that you are children of God by faith. 1 Corinthians 1-2 in the, in the salutation at the beginning of the, the book of 1 Corinthians calls them. And by the way, if you, if you don't know this, Corinth was a pretty messy church. Okay, there was a lot of stuff going on in Corinth. And Paul's kind of brought some of that out in his sermon series. But it, it was a pretty messy church. But he says that you are, I'm writing to you who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. That means set apart and made holy. Okay, that's who you are. Um, it also in the same verse says it calls them uh, it says also those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ so that's the same kind of people Galatians 1 4 is addressed to those uh, it says it speaks of Christ who gave himself for our sins that is you and me the, the people me the writer Paul and you that I'm writing to you Galatians Church of, Gal uh, of Galatia. 1 Thessalonians 1 6, he describes them as followers of the Lord in that church. In Acts 2, we see the, the beginnings of the gathering of churches in their, in their new covenant character, at least in, in Acts 2, verse 41. It says, So those who received his word, this is Paul after Peter preached. At Pentecost, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Okay? Now, this adding and this ability to count 3,000 people means that, that, that this wasn't just an inner thing, that 3,000 people went home saved but, un, but unable to see it on the outside. It means that 3,000 people became a part of an organization together in Jerusalem that you could actually see and count the people okay so the adding was an outward adding and it says that those who received his word were baptized and were added okay so then in verse 47 who is being added again it just sort of puts an underscore under exactly who's being added verse 47 and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay? That's exactly the description of the church. It's those who were being saved. Those were the ones that were being added. Okay. So that's kind of the broad case, I would say, for the idea that the church ought to reflect the, the character of the new covenant. But I want to recognize a, a difficulty that, I, that some of our friends might bring up and that we all need to acknowledge. And, and man, we, we really, we need to be thoroughly aware of this, and that is Scripture and our own experience acknowledges that the church as a visible organization and the church as the body of Christ will not line up perfectly. Regrettably, sometimes there will be people brought into the membership and added, counted, that aren't truly converted. They're not real Christians. They have not experienced that. These, they're not 
truly described by these things. They don't really have a new heart. Their sins aren't really forgiven. Um, and then there's some people who, for one reason or another, uh, due to confusion or, or something uh, uh, in some way, um, are never, never joined a local church, are never added, and they're not recognized as believers. So, that, so there, you see a discrepancy in both directions. Okay, we need to admit that. But the fact that there is a discrepancy between the church members and converted people, that does not authorize us to admit the unconverted, and it does not authorize us to exclude the converted. Okay? So, I'm going to make an admission to you. Really kind of embarrassing, but then we, I live in Auburn, Alabama, and I think I'm, everybody is in this same boat, but... Okay, we have some roaches in our house. Every once in a while, not often, but I'll see a roach in my house. Okay, I may hear about this from Debbie when I get home. You shouldn't have told them we have. <laughs> um, I mean, if I told you I didn't have roaches in my house, you'd know I was lying, right? Every once in a while, we'll see a roach in our house. Okay, but, and so, yeah, I acknowledge that they're not supposed to be there. I don't want them there, but somehow or another, they get in there. But that does not make it okay or acceptable or uh, attractive for me to just leave raw meat lying around and, uh, you know, food and, and dust bunnies in the corners and all that sort of thing to attract more roaches. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that I should just say, well, they're going to be here anyway, so there's no point in putting out any roach traps or worrying about it. They're just, let's let them, you know, let them scamper. Um, uh, you know, we wouldn't do that. We, we don't welcome them in there just because there's a discrepancy between the ideal house situation and what we actually experience, okay? Um, and so likewise, I think the, the church, the principle is, is true in the church. The, the local church is... Christ's sheepfold. It's Christ's flock. It's the place where Christ shepherds his people. God appoints shepherds for local churches. And, and if you didn't know this, the word pastor is really, it just means shepherd. The origin of the word pastor is the same. It's, it just means shepherd, literally. So a pastor is just a shepherd. God appoints shepherds for local churches. So local churches must be the place for all of God's sheep. So sheep ought to be not wandering around out there alone um, without any kind of protection. Um, and we know that Christ pursues wandering sheep. And so should we. So if we see sheep that are out there, unconnected, wandering around without the shepherding of a local church and everything that, that is involved there, we ought to be encouraging people Come in. Come into the flock. Be protected. Don't be out there scavenging in the gut, get, uh, grazing in the flock, in the, in the fields that God has provided. Okay? So we should be doing that. But second of all, our membership process, um, at, and I'm speaking specifically at Grace Heritage, but other church, many other churches have a very similar membership process. Uh, that process is designed to help us discern those who are members of the new covenant and, and the, who rightly belong in the local church. Now, we're not going to do that perfectly, and, and we don't have authorization to uh, do heart surgery to go in and see, you know, and that wouldn't tell us anything anyway. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't send out uh, investigators to go to your house and look in your closets or go to your work or anything like that. Um, we, it's based on... Um, a, a, a credible profession, but not, uh, you know, some kind of paranoid thing, just like in the same sense that, you know, I don't want roaches in my house, but I don't sit there at night when I, with a, you know, with raid just waiting, you know, okay, I saw one just crawl out from under, like that. I don't do that because that's not the main focus of what I'm trying to do in my house. It's not primarily about keeping down the roaches. Okay. Um, 
so anyway, the, the, the next thing, though, is that, that Jesus himself also instructed the church that in cases where people clearly demonstrate that they do not have the character of members of the new covenant, that they are not repenting of their sin and responding to shepherding, then ultimately, after a, after a process, Jesus instructs us to remove those people from membership, to put them outside of that flock, okay? So we see that Christ himself is concerned about maintaining the identity and character of the church. That's Matthew 18, verses uh, 16 through 20, if you want to look that up, okay? Now, I want to go uh, look specifically at two things, and one of them very briefly, but the other one in more detail. Some churches and individuals do not practice membership in the local church, and that's gotten to be kind of a, a, a more newly popular thing. We just don't have a membership at all. You just come, you can worship with us, you can give, but there's no, no formal membership at all. But I think that this damages and obscures the, the display of the new covenant because it doesn't give a mechanism for uh, distinguishing those who are in the new covenant from those who are out, those who are in the church and those who are in the world. Christ's sheep ought to desire a connection with the flock, if you're a sheep, you ought to want a shepherd. Uh, you want, ought to want to be with other sheep. That's naturally what sheep do. They don't like to be alone. They like to be with the flock. And, um, and that ought to be the natural tendency of sheep. But churches ought to distinguish sheep and goats for the protection, assurance, and encouragement of the sheep. Okay, that's important to protect, assure, and encourage sheep who are in the local body, and to warn the goats. You're outside. There's a reason why you're outside. You're in danger. You need to be changed. You need what the new covenant offers. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about that in particular. I want to spend the rest of the time talking about the specifics of, of infants in church membership and the implication for infant baptism. Mm-hmm. I just find that the point you're just making extremely helpful practically because I have so many decisions to make every day and knowing who it is I have agreed. If you don't, if you want to call, don't want to call it membership, it's fine. Right? But who have I agreed? I'm going to make time for you. You're going to make time for me. If I go astray, you can come after me. If you do, I'm allowed to come after you. Who am I supposed to submit to even if I disagree? Right. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's very helpful, practically speaking, to, to, have, to know where, where the buck stops, so to speak, in terms of our accountability and, and responsibility to each other and, and so forth. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. So, so the next thing, some churches include infants of believers in their membership, and they baptize them. And I believe this confuses the nature of the church and the status of infants as well. So um, let me just remind you, and I think we, uh, people on both sides of this issue would agree with this, that baptism portrays union with Christ and union with his people. Uh, it, it visibly depicts union with a visible and local church. So again, let me remind you, Acts 2.41, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So baptism, main point I'm trying to say here is baptism is associated with at, at least visible outward membership. Okay? To, become, to be baptized is to associate yourself with the church in its visible form, which is the local church. All right? So that kind of underscore, I mean, uh, as a backdrop to everything I'm going to say from this point on. So to be fair, I want to just lay out quickly what those who support infant baptism would say uh, in, in, in support of it. And this comes from a slightly modified um, or adapted, I should say, version of something that I got from a book by Robert Booth called Children of Promise. Uh, Booth was a Baptist who became a uh, 
Presbyterian. Uh, let me give you another word, pedobaptist, which just means people who believe in infant baptism. Pedo means infant. So pedobaptist is someone who believes in infant baptism. Sometimes that's contrasted with credo-baptist, if you want to keep all the nice Latin terms in there. Credo-baptist, someone who believes in baptism of believers only. So you can be, use fancy words like that to describe these two different positions. Okay, So here's what he, his basic arguments are. First of all, the first pillar is covenant theology. Throughout the Bible, God relates to his people by way of a covenant of grace. Covenant theology provides the basic framework for rightly interpreting Scripture. So we, we might want to add to that, but generally we, we think that sounds good. And I've been saying the same thing in, the cl in this class for six weeks on covenant theology, that this does provide a framework for Scripture. Pillar number two, the continuity of the covenant of grace. The Bible teaches one and the same way of salvation in both the Old and the New Testaments, despite some different outward requirements. Again, that sounds good. We believe that salvation, that people were saved in the Old Testament in the same way that they're saved in the New. That is by the work of Christ. They look forward to the work of Christ. We look back, but it's on the same basis, the work of Christ. Now, some of the things that are hidden in some of these phrases, we could maybe pick apart, but generally, we're, we're, that would be... We'd be good with that. Okay, so then the third thing is, since there's one covenant of grace between God and man, there is one continuous people of God, the church, in the Old and New Testaments. Okay, and here's where we might want to start uh, making some distinctions. It, we're not entirely in disagreement with that, but, um, but the framework that we, uh, through which we look at it is different and might... Uh, we might take some issue with that, so we're going to get into that in a little more detail as we go. Okay, number four is that uh, is continuity of households. That is, so here we're kind of looking at it as membership primarily. God included Abraham and his offspring in the covenant. Okay, and so therefore whole households are included in God's redemptive covenant. That this was a paradigm in a sense, a model for the way God works with his covenant people. He included Abraham and his offspring, so in whole households are to be included in God's redemptive covenant going forward even into the new covenant. So, And then the fifth one is con continuity of the covenant signs. Obviously, baptism is different from circumcision, which was given to Abraham, but baptism is the sign of the covenant in the New Testament just as circumcision was the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament. And like circumcision, baptism is to be applied to the offspring of the household. So that's, in essence, the, the argument. And let me just say, this is a very logical argument. It's very uh, self-consistent. And, and it's not people that believe this. They're not stupid. And probably most of them are way smarter than most of us. Okay? Um, it's just a different framework. And it has some different presuppositions. And they play out differently in a very logical and sensible kind of way. All right, so let's give credit to those who, who believe these things. There are some incredibly uh, gifted, uh, smart, and godly people who believe this, and, and, and it all makes sense in a, in a coherent framework. And in fact, I think what you'll see is that all of this is based on this thing that I've shown you before, that there's a certain way of looking at the covenant of grace and the relationship of the old and new covenants that is underlying all of that, okay? So this is what the, the, that version of covenant theology says. It's the, you can see that this, there's a continuity going on throughout from old to new covenant, that the internal substance is the same. There are some externals, that even the externals are the same in many ways. And in essence, the, the differences are only those things which are uh, explicitly uh, revoked or changed in the new covenant. So you see a great deal of continuity stressed here between old and new covenant, where the whole thing is the covenant of grace. Okay, old covenant is the covenant of grace, the new covenant is the covenant of grace. The old covenant is what we would say an, an administration or an implementation of the covenant of grace, and the new covenant is a, uh, a, a new improved um, administration or implementation 
of the covenant of grace. Okay. Um, in contrast, this is the, the perspective that, that I've been teaching and that I think is, is historic Baptist covenant theology. Um, and it's reflected in our confession. And it says that the covenant of grace is not the old covenant. The old covenant is, is not a, a covenant of grace, but it is, it is a conditional covenant, or it's actually a series of conditional covenants that have a purpose in, in leading people to the new covenant and the covenant of grace, but it's not the new covenant. It's not the covenant of grace. Um, and, and throughout the old covenant, we see that various promises and shadows and types point forward to the new covenant. Okay? So it's not like the revelation of grace is, not, is, is absent. Okay? It's very much there in in Abraham and in um, the Mosaic Covenant with the sacrifices and all those things that pointed to the, the uh, grace and mercy that were available in the New Covenant. But it's not actually provided, it's not actually done or given or accomplished until the New Covenant. So the Old Covenant is a separate covenant that um, had its own purposes, which you can go back to and, and listen to the audio from the uh, previous messages if you want to get all that in, in great detail. But in the process of doing that, the covenant of grace was revealed and pointed to pointing forward. Okay. So now we can, I, I think that this is, allows us to, to take scripture at face value more faithfully. It allows us to recognize the sharp discontinuity that scripture very clearly teaches in Galatians 4. There are two covenants it says, um, and one is a covenant of promise, uh, one is a, a slave, one's for a slaves, one's free. Um, it's very, very uh, contrasting kinds of language between old and new. And yet, at the same time, it allows us to say salvation is on the same basis in the old covenant as in the new. Because believers in the old covenant were not saved on the basis of the old covenant. The old covenant didn't provide their salvation. It was looking forward to what would be done in the new covenant that would provide their salvation, okay? But then they were still saved. In a sense, they were saved on the basis of the new covenant, reaching back and saving them in the, in the old covenant, okay? So that's the perspective, the uh, confessional Baptist covenant theology perspective. And I think that once you really see the arguments for that perspective or that framework versus the other one, most of these questions are answered um, right off, okay? So, um, so let me talk about three different points of confusion that I think show up in that, in that argument. And um, I, I don't know how in how much detail I'm going to be able to do here in the next eight minutes or so, but um, I, I think that the, the essence of the issue is that the Pedobaptist covenant theology is, a, is based on a mistaken understanding of the relationship of the old and new covenants and the playing out of, of that of infant membership. Okay. So the first one is a point of confusion is the relationship of baptism to circumcision. The second point of confusion is the proper recipients of circumcision. And the third is the connection to the covenant promises to Abraham. So, first of all, I want us to see that, that baptism is not an exact replacement for circumcision. They're not exactly parallel in the Old and New Covenants. First of all, what did circumcision mean? Circumcision was given to Abraham for his physical descendants, right? So, it was, a, it was specifically for his uh, physical descendants, he said... You are to continue to uh, circumcise your offspring through, down through the generations, it says. And there was a promise given literally to his physical descendants that uh, they would have, that, that he, that through the, his descendants he would become a father of many nations, that he would have many descendants, that they would be given a land, the land of Canaan. I mean, this is literal, right? That really happened. That's, that wasn't just... Just It was a type. It was a, a symbol of, of a greater reality. 
But it was a reality itself. I mean, it, it really happened, right? They, he did give them, he said, walk around this, look around. This is the land I'm going to give you. He said, I'm going to make you do uh, many nations. He literally did that, okay? He, uh, he said, I'm going to give you a descendant when he didn't have any descendants at all, and it took a miracle from God to do it, and he did, gave them physical descendants, okay? So these were the things that circumcision pointed to. Isn't it? Obvious that, that circumcision in its symbolism is specifically tied to the idea of offspring? I mean, why would you choose a symbol like that? Doesn't it specifically tie in to the concept of offspring? Um, it was, um, so it, it seems different. And baptism does not have that kind of symbolism to it of symbolizing offspring. And it's because circumcision was a seal of the thing that was going to save Abraham and everyone else in both the Old and the New Covenants. That is the offspring. It, was a, it pointed to what God was going to do in bringing the offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ. So circumcision had that reference that baptism does not. It doesn't need any kind of reference to offspring because Christ has come. Right? So uh, baptism and circumcision are not alike in that sense. Baptism does not uh, promise us a land in Canaan. It does not promise us any descendants. It doesn't promise us um, to be the father of many nations. None of that stuff is promised by, by baptism. Not only that, but circumcision is specifically tied to a conditional covenant. Not a covenant of grace, but a conditional covenant. Um, in, in many places in the New Testament, we are taught that circumcision is the beginning of, you know, if you're, what advantage does circumcision have? Well, it's, it has an advantage if you obey the whole law, right? Circumcision is the beginning point of commitment to obey the whole law. It is a, it is a legal uh, symbol. It's a symbol of, of um, satisfying covenant obligations. It's the very opposite basis than the new covenant, which is about not satisfying your own co covenant obligations, but only having God sovereignly do something in you. Okay, very, very different um, basis of what they, the two things symbolize. Um, also, we noticed that, you remember in Acts 15, there were certain Judaizers that wanted Gentiles to be circumcised too and to obey the whole law. Remember that? And so it was stirring up a lot of trouble in the churches. And so they sent a delegation to the apostles and elders in uh, Jerusalem to try to deal with this question. And so they deal with the whole question of circumcision, of these Judaizers wanting people to be circumcised. And what's amazing is what they did not say. They could have dealt with the whole issue in one statement. Don't you know that baptism replaced circumcision? Why are you asking these people to be circumcised? They've been baptized. End of story. They never mention that. I think that's kind of odd if baptism replaces circumcision. Okay. Um, second thing is that uh, circumcision was not commanded for the children of believers in the Old Covenant but it was commanded for the offspring of Abraham, the literal, physical offspring of Abraham. It says in Genesis 17, you and your offspring down through the generations, every male throughout your generations shall be circumcised. It's the connection to Abraham that gave them the right to circumcision, not the connection to their believing parents that gave them the right to circumcision. Now the Pharisees understood that, even, uh, because when they came to be baptized by John, they thought that that same privilege that gave them circumcision was going to give them baptism. And John said, um, you know, uh, God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. That's not going to do it here. That's not going to qualify you for the baptism that I'm offering. Jesus said they weren't children of Abraham spiritually. Anyway, they were children of the devil. Um, 
Okay. So then, probably, if you would turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to show you this last thing just because we're totally out of time for now. Um, Galatians chapter 3. And I'm going to just kind of skim you right through there and show you a couple of things in here. First of all, verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Okay, so the, the issue here is how do you get connected to the grace offered in the Abrahamic covenant? Well, remember the grace offered in the Abrahamic covenant is point, points forward to the new covenant. But how do you get connected to it? By having believing parents? No, by being a son of Abraham, by being an offspring of Abraham. How do you do that? Do you become a Jew? No, you become you have the faith of Abraham. You trust in the same one that he trusted in when he looked forward and saw Christ's day. Okay? Those of faith are the sons of Abraham. Okay? Look down. It goes on down. Um, let's see. Uh, go on down to... Yeah, this, down to the bottom of the chapter. Um, it says, For in Christ Jesus, in verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you ha as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither, male, or there's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to promise. You see, the connection to Abraham is a spiritual connection. And what pedobaptists do who bring in their children, they're trying to make a physical connection that's kind of like a physical connection to us and then a spiritual connection to Abraham. But there was, there's no such thing recognized in Scripture. For Abraham, there were two types of Abraham's seed. There were those who were physically his offspring, literal physical offspring, directly, and then there were those who were his spiritual offspring, directly. But there was nothing of uh, physical offspring of spiritual offspring to, to be connected to Abraham at all. So it's, uh, the, the connection to the covenant promises are, of Abraham are confused in that way. I'm sorry I'm not going to have more time to go into the, these arguments right now, but um, I, I'll say that um, I have sent an email about this, but after... I know this is a big topic, and so I plan to talk big about it, and I'm going to talk some more. So after the, um, the meal, once we get cleaned up and everything, I'm going to uh, talk some more about this, and I've got a lot more to say about this, and I'm sure you have questions. And if you would like to, to hear more and interact more and ask questions, um, we're going to spend some time this afternoon, probably a couple of hours, you don't have to stay for that whole time if that's too long for you. It's probably too long for me, and I'll be falling out near the end of it. But I'm going to do my best um, because I think it's important. And um, so we're going to go into some more detail on that. Um, and I would, I, I do plan to record it, yes, um, if my faithful assistants help me in doing that, Jonathan. Um, all right. So let me just close by saying that Bapt baptism of being baptized is a blessing and a privilege. And Galatians 3.27, which I just read, uh, reminds us that to be baptized into Christ is to put on Christ. What a tremendous privilege it is to be identified with Christ. I mean, how could the, those who are his enemies, rebels, sinners, imagine anything more a greater privilege than to be identified with Christ. And so we, we wrestle over these things and we may disagree over these things, but, but what we want to do is lift up Christ. And uh, so let's go to the scriptures and see how he has asked us or called us to do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we, we come to you uh, humbled by the, the complexity of, of this topic and, and the fact that godly people have disagreed over this
over uh, many centuries. And yet, Father, you have called us to, to live out our lives faithfully before you and to hear your word. And I ask that you'd give us clarity on this topic, that we would be able to respond in obedience and in confidence with um, conviction from your word. Um, we recognize that we need to be able to go forward together as a body with uh, common conviction. And we ask, Father, that you'd grant that to us. <clears throat> For those who might be confused or upset by this, Father, I ask that you would just grant them help in uh, uh, being open to what your word says, regardless of whether they agree with my conclusions or not, that, uh, that they would find themselves uh, answerable to you because you are our master. You are the one to whom we all must give an account. So may we do that faithfully and may we do that recognizing your uh, amazing grace and mercy to us all. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.